The RCMP Heritage Center is a not-for-profit charitable organization mandated to share the story of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. This is one of those stories, part of your heritage. They called us the Northwest Mounted Police. We came west when the West was young. In the summer of 1874, our work had just begun. We'd come from every walk of life to seek adventure in the vast Northwest, farmers, soldiers, and schoolboys, Canadian youth at its best. Uh, we'd spent the winter in Winnipeg where we learned to shoot and ride. From Sergeant Major Big Sam Steele, we first learned Mountie pride. Sam Steele was a tough young son of a gun who took everything in stride, but when the weather was worse than 30 below, he didn't make us ride. But he shaped us up for that marathon trek that was known as the Great March West and would take us from Fort Dufferin to the hub of that hornet's nest, where whiskey and killing was rampant in a place called Fort Whoop Up and Canadian Indians were being plagued in their very own wiki up. The Great March West, a magnificent sight, saw 300 mounted men in troops of bays and greys and blacks, but it was not just equestrian. There were teams of horses and beef on the hoof, and following in behind was a string of oxen with Red River carts. You could see the parade dewind its way across the prairie in a colorful array, those red-coated young adventurers making 20 miles a day. Well, the first outlaws were soon routed in respect of the natives gained, but the redcoats still had a job to do so on the prairies, we remained. We were here when the mighty Crowfoot, chief of the Blackfoot Nation, told Sitting Bull to leave us alone or face Blackfoot retaliation. The railway, as promised, soon rolled west across the open plain and brought a rush of settlers, but we were here to keep it tame. From the edge of Upper Canada, far west to the Great Divide, sprawled the Northwest Territories, a thousand miles wide, and from those territories came the provinces three, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. Homes for people who longed to be free to pursue their dream of happiness in a place they could call their own and put down roots in that prairie sod and never have to roam. Well, we served with French and then McLeod as leaders of the force. Loyalty, bravery, valor, and pride were just a matter of course. The legendary Jerry Potts became a member of our band. That bow-legged little Métis scout helped us find our way around the land. Now, there was Allen, who unhorsed Sitting Bull, and McDonald, who took his gun when the Sioux had come north of the medicine line and outnumbered us 20 to 1. Oh, there were many living legends in that first 300 men, and we'd ride with them to the gates of hell and ride right back again. And when times got tough and we wanted to quit, We'd think of Big Sam Steele for the pride and the bravery he'd instilled was something very real. And we knew if we could carry on a heritage we'd bequeath to those who followed after us when our bones were laid beneath the sod that we'd protected in the days of the wild frontier when we'd first promised to maintain the right without favor, affection, or fear. Yes, they called us the Northwest Mounted Police. We came west when the west was young. But 140 years later, our work is still not done. I was born and raised in Grand View, Manitoba, uh, and uh, my parents farmed in that area, and I, uh, but we'd left the farm by the time I was 13, lived in the town, 
grand view. I guess I'd be probably around 17 and the mounted police were advertising for men. This is in 1951. And uh, I didn't realize that my mother was paying attention to the same ads, but she didn't say anything to me because she didn't want to influence me one way or the other. And I, one morning I was having breakfast and I said, you know, I kind of wonder if I'd be able to make it in the mounted police. And she says, I was wondering about that. So I said, well, maybe I should give it a try. And I wasn't any brilliant student. I was getting by fine in, in school, but anyway, uh, I went on the, uh, well, I just turned 18 in June, graduated grade 12, went down to uh, Dauphin where the detachment was early part of July with a letter from my pastor and school principal and my employer and a guy I worked with in the co-op store there part-time and uh, down to the bus to Dauphin and got off the bus and walked around town till the detachment opened at eight uh, eight o'clock or eight thirty whenever it was and walked up to the detachment and looked at this young fellow that wasn't a whole lot older than me and said I'd like to see about joining the mounted police so he introduced me to a what was a corporal. I had no idea what a corporal was. I had no idea about the modern police because we really didn't have any close connection with them as, as a family. And they were far enough away that we, you know, I hadn't been in trouble, so I wouldn't, wasn't acquainted with the modern police. So I uh, started there and uh, met the sergeant who uh, <clears throat> put me through the, uh, the initial tests and so on. And, and uh, so he said, well, how'd you get here? And I said, well, I came in the Greyhound bus. And oh, he said, we'll get you ride home. I couldn't believe that. And he called a member and he said, you're going to Grandview, aren't you, Roy? I said, and he said, yeah. He said, please give this young fellow a ride home. And a few things happened after that. And actually, quite quickly, because by about September, October, I was given a letter that uh, you've been accepted and if you report to D Division Headquarters in Winnipeg and at, at your convenience, uh, tell us when you're going to come and we'll take it from there. So I agreed to be there for the 3rd of December in 1952. They put me through my final medical and uh, got sworn into the, to the force and the, uh, uh, that, that night spent my first night in barracks and uh, I it was interesting the people I like the the family attitude that I found Im immediately these guys I didn't know but I was now a member of the mounted police I couldn't believe this I mean it was it, it kind of happened so quickly it was what I really thought I wanted and uh, went from there to uh, training in Vancouver, they were, the force had just taken over the British Columbia Provincial Police. And this, the rumor we heard was that they needed some recruits in Fairmont in Vancouver to do fatigues while these BCPs were being uh, re-indoctrinated re into the mounted police. Well, what was particularly good about that, and I met, of course, the, the great guys that you meet in your squad. The 30, it was a 30-man squad in those days. I met these wonderful people, but uh, we had particularly good instructors. They were older, more mature instructors. These were like staff sergeants and sergeants, as opposed to corporals usually. Lots of experience, and one in particular was a, a drill instructor by the name of, his first name was Staff. <laughs> Staff Griffiths. I never did, ever did, I uh, don't think until I read his obituary, you know, that what his, uh, what his first name was. But uh, he was good and tough, and he knew drill better than anybody I ever knew until I ran into Bill McRae and 
in Zappo here. But he, he was wonderful and, and mean and tough and, and he shaped us up. During that winter, we became very good at drill. We did, everything else went well too. We were, were the only troop in, the, in or squad in, in the place, uh, recruit squad. And uh, when we got to Depo in the spring of, of uh, 53, we ran into some flack from people who had spent a particularly cold winter here. I remember the first thing, they, we, we got off the train, came out here, we were on, uh, on the parade square in front of B Block, the old B Block, and uh, I heard from somebody watching us inside B Block, well, there's Sam Browns or no hell. And I uh, thought, oh boy, we're in for it. And it was one of the re other recruits that made this comment who I, I got to know later. But we arrived here, like I said, with a little better than average level of drill. And uh, we, and that didn't really make us any more popular with the other recruits because we were picked over two senior troops, squads, I should say. And it's funny, we were, we're using, use the term troops now, but it was squads then. And we were picked over these two senior squads to be the squad from Depo that would march in the coronation parade in June of 1953 because of our particularly good skill at drill. I remember that. And training was, training was wonderful. It was tough. It was, it was, yeah, it was just all I could handle. I, I, I remember I was on the edge a lot of the time. And I can remember in, in Vancouver, old uh, staff Griffiths, he would go around and he would, he would pick out different individuals and he would ride us. And, and he was on me at one point and he, he said, Robertson, where did you, what did you do before you joined the force? And I said, I worked in a store staff. He says, well, go back to the bloody store. We don't need you in the mounted police. And I thought, you know, well, you're not gonna get rid of me that easy. And of course it had the exact effect that he wanted it to be. And I worked a little harder and got by. But it was, it was wonderful. Things like that, we had, we had Elmer Curtin for uh, PT. He was tough and a little on the mean side. And, but we survived him as well. And I think we were a pretty good troop and squad in training. And, and I, uh, you know, as I look back at it, I, you know, a lot of enjoyable times, wonderful people. That's where I, I got my, my nickname, uh, Cal Alexander, one of my uh, squad mates. Uh, uh, there, the idea of Robbie being a nickname for anybody with the name Robinson or Robertson uh, kind of fell in place. And, and so he, he put that on me and I, I got Robbie and I've had Robbie most of the time ever since. Uh, after training, you know, well, recruit time was kind of, worth nothing. And, and we graduated probably second week in August. We didn't get the musical or didn't get the, didn't get equitation training because they were in a hurry to get people out. And there was a, the place was full of recruits. We had this, Depo was a very busy place at that time. So we, we uh, graduated in, in early August and they just kept us behind to uh, run the, the butts for the rifle range for F Division to do their annual qualification. We stayed here for two weeks just doing fatigues. And then finally hit the field. My, my posting was to F Division, Saskatchewan, and Swift Current Subdivision. I got there and uh, was met by a fellow that I'd <coughs> known from training and uh, he picked me up at the train and helped me haul my trunk up to the third floor of the old mansion that was the detachment and subdivision building in Swift Current. Next morning I, I got to meet the detachment commander and his name was Curly Sharp, he was a sergeant and he had been in depot 
to lecture on cattle brands, and we had had him lecture probably in, I don't know, a month or two earlier. And I remember after he had, had spoken to us that morning, we were having lunch at the mess, and somebody said, wouldn't that be the ideal guy to end up on detachment with? And here I ended up with him. He was a wonderful man, uh, an old guy. Uh, I was concerned later on when he and, and the section NCO, who was also an old guy, went out to arrest some fairly substantial criminals. These guys were, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that case in a minute, but these, these were, were real, we, we'd call them organized criminals now. And I remember being concerned about these two old guys going out to make these arrests of these three people because these sergeants were old. And I remember later checking when I, I guess it wasn't until I read it on their tombstones, but these guys were about 42 years old. And I thought, goodness sakes, I, you know, I mean, we should, there should be some younger guys go along with them to help them make this arrest. And I thought, well, what, a, what a funny thing. And I'm, I'm sure that as I got older, how old young people must have thought I was. But so it was a wonderful place, a good place to start. Uh, all the help you needed, allowed to make a mistake, and lots of good coaching. And, and uh, it really got me to love police work. I, I, I definitely decided after I got out of training and in, and into detachment work that that was, that was a life for me. They had a, a case going and, and where these two guys were, these three guys were arrested. And it resulted in the conviction, the first conviction for under the Habitual Criminals Act. And I was able to do tidbits. I, I wasn't involved in a serious part of the investigation at all, but I, I did errands and did, uh, I, I remember going to stores and hotels, or uh, stores and drug stores and trying to find out different things that these guys may have bought along the way. But I thought later on, that was, you know, I was very fortunate to be able to have that opportunity. Went from there to, I was only there for about three months and uh, did a few prisoner escorts and stuff like that. Then on to the next detachment where it was a, a two-man or three-man post at Gravelberg. And, and uh, it was just, just wonderful. I worked with a, with a fellow by the name of Torchy Torsan. Uh, and he was green out of training, but he was a brilliant guy. And uh, we had information that these guys were going to take a safe at a payer and a payer is a, a store that, that in those days, and I don't think they're around anymore, that handles extra money because there's no, no, no bank in town. And they had a safe in this place, and, and the word was that these guys, and we knew who they were, had information on this payer, and they were going to take the safe in this payer. So Torchy and I went out, and we... We hid the police car in the, I mean, we're in uniform. We hid the police car in the, in the elevator and went out and, and lay in the ditch back of this store waiting for these guys to come. We'd driven past their house before we went out, because they lived in Swift Current, before we went out to the town of Success where this was. And there was a party going on. So we thought, well, these guys get gassed up and then they'll be ready to, ready to go and do this job. We lay there, lay there, Three o'clock, four o'clock, sun starts coming up, getting pre. So we got nothing, nothing happened, and so we got back in the car, went back to town, drove past this place again. The party's still going on, <laughs> so we thought, well, I guess they're not going to do anything tonight because it's daylight. We we went back to barracks, went to bed, went out for lunch about noon, and and. Uh, we get back from lunch and there's some farmer and his son were in the detachment to report a theft of a, an electric drill. I mean, back in those days, a big electric drill that they'd have on the farm was worth a lot of money and uh, probably two or three hundred dollars. So 
we took this complaint and they said that these guys had, they, the family was away to, away to church, but the, the daughter-in-law was home and these three guys had come into the yard in a car and driven in and driven up to the shop and went in there and picked up this electric drill and a couple of other odds and ends and, and got back in their car and took off again. Of course, she didn't get a license number. She got a bit of a description of the car. She didn't know cars very well and a bit of a description of what these guys looked like. And to make a long story short, about four or five days later, when we were looking all over the country to try and figure out who this was that did this little theft, and sure enough, zeroed it back to these guys that we had suspected we were going to take the payer at success. And uh, so we went, uh, we, we, they arrested them, this, these, these two old sergeants went out and arrested them and, and they brought them in, put them in a lineup and this girl was able to identify them because they were, <laughs> mostly because they were wearing the same clothes that they were wearing <laughs> five or six days earlier when they started on this bender. And uh, so as a result of that, the one guy had a long, criminal record, the two brothers and a, and, a, and a friend. And the one brother had a particularly long record of really variety of, of heavy criminal activity. And so the, the uh, Habitual Criminals Act is brand new and, and Curly Sharp said, let's go for the Habitual Criminals Act, try to see if we can convict this sucker and put him away. And they did and they convicted him as a result of, of that. So it, it turned out to be a, a you know, a gain. I thought, man, this is, this is keen stuff. And so I, w I was smitten, there's no question about it. I was gonna be a policeman. This is a true story with a little poetic license. It's called Junior Man Prue. 1951, it was in the fall, the Mounties from Dauphin, one and all, were ordered to clean and polish kit and make sure they're Scarlet tunics fit. Their boots were shined with spit and polish. No chance they'd taken looking foolish. The task ahead was a noble one for the Mounties in 1951. Princess Elizabeth, our queen to be, was coming to Brandon for the folks to see. The royal train traveled from coast to coast so Canadians could make the most of a visit by our princess and handsome prince. They weren't here before, but they have been since. Meanwhile in Dauphin, the Mounties all, on a Sunday morning as I recall, rose up early while it was still dark and headed south through Riding Mountain Park. Now try to picture this impressive sight as these men set forth to maintain the right. A convoy of cars filled with men in red as due south through the park they sped. Now just as the sun was getting bright, some poachers of elk, had spent the night within the borders of the National Park with designs on, a, on an elk in the moonlit dark. The hunt was successful, a bull elk bagged, but because he was poached, he wasn't tagged. Hunting in the park was against the law, and as he was dragged from the woods, the Mounties saw. Yes, the Mounties saw the elk that day, and the two elk hunters, as they made their way, hauling their prize to their pickup truck, pleased with themselves in their hunting luck. Well, their, their smiles of joy then turned to frowns as a dozen Mounties all stepped down out of that convoy of cruiser cars. All the poachers could see was prison bars. Two arrests were made that fateful day by a sergeant who was heard to say, listen up men, we must be on the move, so will the junior man step up and prove the princess and prince you'll not see today because you're gonna yard these guys away back to Dauphin to the Crowbar Hotel as they tell their tale, just listen well. As the junior man drove that pickup truck back to Dauphin, he cussed his luck. It was, it was a sight to behold that autumn day as the Mountie drove the truck away right through town with an elk in the box and two red-faced poachers on the rocks. The truck was forfeited to the crown, elk meat served in the hospital in town. Two poachers did time for a month or two, but the thing those Mounties never knew was that the guy who organized the hunt that day was never caught. No, he got away. It bothered him when he saw all that red and 
through and back in the woods that hunter fled. Well, to this day, the ringleader hasn't been caught, though some folks around Dauphin know a lot. So the moral to this tale about way back when is that the Mounties don't always get all of their men. Gravelburg was a great town, a uh, little French community, and uh, a, a corporal in charge, two constables, town beat, one guy, you'd, you'd take a month on town beat and a month work in the detachment with the corporal. And I spent the winter there and, and uh, it was really good experience. The, the corporal was, in, well, two corporals that I worked for there, uh, uh, Corporal Ross and then later on with Ken Bradshaw, took over from him and great mentors, both of them helped me uh, a lot and it gave me a really good grounding and a good attitude uh, towards police work and towards force. And uh, in uh, the following June, they were gonna beef up the highway patrol in Saskatchewan and so I got transferred into Regina, back to Regina to uh, work highway patrol. What I hadn't mentioned earlier is I, <clears throat> I met this girl in, uh, I, I, I went to church on a fairly regular basis and, and met this girl. And uh, we were still going steady. By the time I got back to Regina, and of course, uh, so this was really, really convenient for, from that perspective. And uh, her name was Doreen Windrum. And, and uh, by the time we got back, uh, by the time I uh, was on highway patrol for a year or so, we decided, man, we'd like to get married. and, and uh, so it was, uh, didn't have enough service, you know, you needed the thousand dollars in the bank, the five year service and be 24 years of age and I didn't have any of those, although I knew I could borrow the thousand dollars from somebody. But uh, anyway, so I purchased my discharge and uh, left the force I'd, and I, I uh, actually before I got out, I, I had uh, applied for the Regina City Police and was accepted there. So I enjoyed that job. And uh, after a year of walking the beat, I ended up getting into uh, the traffic division and riding a motorcycle, and I was pretty, uh, really enjoyed that as well. So while I was, I, I ended up staying in the Regina City Police for 13 years. I had good times there and great experience. I worked every division and every detail during that time I was there, and again got some really good experience. And then I kind of got little, well, I got to the point where maybe I really should think about getting back in the force. And I, I went, come out to Depot, or actually out to F Division headquarters, which was a, a, at Depot, to see about getting back in. And I was amazed at how welcome they made me feel. And I was interviewed by a sergeant by the name of Denny Ling, and he was really encouraging and said, well, yeah, so what would you like to do when you get back in? And I said, well, saying that when I get back in? And he says, yeah, and he says, you're going to get back in. He says, I, when I recommend it, he says, they usually accept it. <laughs> I said, well, I'd like to, go to, like to go to Alberta. And he said, what kind of work would you like to do? And I said, well, I'm working plain clothes in the city. I said, I, eventually, I'd like to get back into plain clothes. So he said, Edmonton or Calgary GIS would be okay for you. I said, yeah.